Look at me. Caps lock, Harry. If you are unfamiliar, this is how some people refer to Harry's behavior, energy, state of mind in the fifth book, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, and it is used as a way to summarize what many feel is the worst aspect of this book. But I'm here to defend it. This video is focused on the book because I think the way the movie handles the context behind his caps lockness is very different. So keep that in mind as you watch. As far as the books go, Order of the Phoenix is probably the most polarizing. I mean, sure, there are people that absolutely hate the ending to Deathly Hallows, Albus Severus Potter, myself included. But when we're talking about the books as a whole, what I frequently see is people placing Book Five at the bottom of their lists, and I continually hear that people skip it on their rereads. To be honest, that used to be me as well. However, I have since done a complete 180 on this book. It took me time, a bit of experience, and a bit of growing up to see that the way this is written is not only necessary, but also not as negative as you might remember. In fact, it might just be the most hauntingly beautiful book of the series. I don't know how else to describe this emotion, but just to give you a quick idea of the feeling I'm talking about, before we go to the main topic of the video, which is Harry, let's quickly take a look at a scene with Neville. In the movie, Neville gets a nice little scene where he tells Harry about what Bellatrix did to his parents, and he says that he's proud to be their son, but isn't ready to let people know just yet. And I like that quote. But the book equivalent to this scene is a completely different emotional beast that has stuck with me for ages. In the book, the Weasley family, along with Harry and Hermione, are spending Christmas at the Wizard Hospital because that's where Arthur is after his attack. While there, they find their way into a ward that is filled with permanent patients that are all dealing with something mentally. For example, they come across Gilderoy Lockhart, and if you remember what happened to him. <laughs> At the end of the chapter, they also run into Neville, and Ron, who has no clue about what happened to Neville's parents, is like, Neville, hi, what's up? What are you doing here? Who are you visiting? And Neville is absolutely mortified. He's purple in the face and can't make eye contact with them. Then Neville's grandma asks him, why haven't you told your friends about your parents? Are you ashamed? And then proceeds to tell everyone how Mr. and Mrs. Longbottom were tortured into insanity. Right after this, Neville's mother slowly walks over to the group. She's very different than she looks in the photo. She has white hair, she's skinny and gaunt looking. Neville stretches out his hand already anticipating that his mom is going to give him something, and she does. She places an empty bubblegum wrapper in his hand. Very nice, dear, said Neville's grandmother in a falsely cheery voice, patting his mother on the shoulder. But Neville said quietly, thanks, mum. His mother tottered away, back up the ward, humming to herself. Neville looked around at the others, his expression defiant, as though daring them to laugh. But Harry did not think he'd ever found anything less funny in his life. Neville's grandma then tells him to throw the wrapper in the bin and that his mother must have given him enough of those to paper his bedroom. But as they leave, Harry sees Neville put the bubblegum wrapper in his pocket. It just absolutely breaks my heart, yet at the same time fills it with this warm feeling at seeing the tragic and also beautiful way Neville deals with his grief. He keeps his parents a secret and is embarrassed to see his classmates there, but also honors his mom by holding on to what little connection they have, even if that connection is as ridiculous and sad as a bubblegum wrapper. And when she's there, his expression to everyone else turns from one of embarrassment to one of defiance. This theme of being an observer to someone's complicated grieving process, both the unpleasant and the beautiful, is something that runs throughout this entire book, especially with Harry. It is what took me a while to fully appreciate, and that's what I want to talk about in this video. Part 1. Blank Slate Harry I think one of the key factors in understanding some of the negative reactions to this book is not simply that Harry is annoying and mean and yells all the time, but understanding what Harry was to the reader before this book and how this book changed that. A blank slate protagonist is one that is a blank slate. They might be surrounded by extraordinary characters in an extraordinary setting and go through extraordinary events, but they themselves are normal and not complex. Sometimes it can be an indicator of amateur writing, but it can also be a deliberate effort that makes for a successful story. 
Harry in the first half of the series is pretty close to a blank slate. That's not to say he was a lifeless, empty vessel, but he was a very, very basic protagonist. If you gave someone the first two books to read and then asked them to describe the characters' personalities without mentioning plot, they could go into a ton of detail in describing Hermione, Ron, Dumbledore, Snape, Hagrid, Malfoy, the Dursleys, anyone. But for Harry, it would be hard to say anything beyond he's a talented, good kid that's brave, I guess. Which isn't nothing, but the most interesting things about Harry are the things that have happened to him in the past and the things that continue to happen to him as the series progresses. When you take out plot and look at him on emotion and personality alone, he doesn't stand out anywhere near the level everyone else does. While everyone around him, muggle or not, exploded with personality, he was just a normal kid. I mean, I'm just Harry. Just Harry. And that is the point. It worked because it meant that everyone reading the story, no matter what they are like, could project themselves onto him. He serves as a way to introduce us into this foreign world and feel like we are in it, experiencing everything for the first time along with Harry. Something that would be harder to do, especially for a children's book, if Harry was more of his own person. You might say this changes a little in Azkaban and Goblet of Fire as we start to see a little more to Harry, such as the intense hatred he has for Sirius, before he knows Sirius is a good person. He was that friend! But even then, what he's feeling in those books is what the reader is supposed to be feeling. The narrative at first wants us to hate Sirius, so therefore has Harry hate Sirius, so we can hate him as well. This changes in Order of the Phoenix. Harry, for once, isn't just a vessel for the reader to place themselves in, but instead his own person that is experiencing his own intense emotion, and the book doesn't care whether you're feeling it with him or not, whether you find it unpleasant or not. You are there to bear witness to what he is going through mentally, and the result is a reading experience that is very different to what we are used to. Part 2. Caps Lock Harry I just feel so angry all the time. We see Harry go through the stages of grief pretty much twice in this book, starting with the first two thirds of the book, where coming right off of what we talked about in the last video, when Harry had just experienced a traumatic event and was in a state of shock, the first few chapters here are of him going through the second and third stages of grief. He has the anxiety of constant nightmares of Cedric's death, the frustration of no one telling him what is going on, the helplessness of being trapped in Privet Drive, not being able to do anything, and all of this leads to hostility. Just as he limped past the window, Hedwig soared through it with a soft rustle of wings. About time, Harry snarled. You can put that down, I've got work for you. Hedwig's large, round, amber eyes gazed at him reproachfully over the dead frog clamped in her beak. Come here, said Harry. Harry, who is clearly being extremely rude to Hedwig, then tells her to deliver letters to Ron, Hermione, and Sirius, and to keep pecking at them until they've written long replies, which is just a little glimpse at the hostility he's currently feeling. Then in the following chapter, when he finally gets to his friends at Grimmauld Place, Caps Lock Harry bursts into the scene. Every bitter and resentful thought Harry had had in the past month was pouring out of him. But why should I know what's going on? Why should anyone bother to tell me what's been happening? Harry, we wanted to tell you, we really did. Can't have wanted to do that much, can you? Or you'd have sent me an owl, but Dumbledore made you swear. Well, he did. Four weeks I've been stuck in Privet Drive, nicking papers out of bins to try and find out what's been going on. First, let's just acknowledge that people are right to say Harry is awful and incredibly unpleasant in these parts of the book. He walks into the room and Hermione wraps her arms around him and is apologizing profusely, trying to explain why they couldn't tell him anything. Harry also sees the deep cuts on their hands from Hedwig pecking at them and he doesn't care about any of this. He doesn't care about the guilt they feel or what explanations they have. He doesn't care that he commanded his owl to wound his friends for something out of their control. He still proceeds to lash out and rail into them. He uses them as a human punching bag to the point where Hermione's in tears. We're really sorry, said Hermione desperately, her eyes now sparkling with tears. But when I read this now, 
I don't just see someone being awful to his friends. What I see is a boy that has been trapped in an abusive household with all this grief and trauma stewing inside of him and not having anyone to talk to about it. And I see that it's not until he's in the presence of people he loves that he feels safe and able to let it all out. And I see that his friends, instead of arguing or shouting back, are understanding and give him the space to go off as much as he needs to. I see Hermione through tears saying, you're absolutely right Harry, I'd be furious if it were me. I see Fred and George coming in and telling him to let it all out while also cracking jokes to defuse the situation. Hello Harry, said George, beaming at him. We thought we heard your dulcet tones. You don't want to bottle up your anger like that Harry. Let it all out, said Fred, also beaming. There might be a couple of people 50 miles away who didn't hear you. If I can just go on a quick tangent to the movie Midsommar, I promise this is relevant to my point. Ever since I saw it, I've always said that watching it was such a cathartic viewing experience for me. Which I know sounds insane to some people because it's a horror movie and it is unbelievably grotesque and unpleasant to watch, but I swear going through the journey of seeing a character hold in her emotion and not allow herself to grieve, to finally letting it all out in a screaming session with a group of people that are holding her, letting her scream, and screaming with her was just so cathartic to watch, despite them being cult members and evil and all of that. This is exactly how I think of Caps Lock Harry now. When Harry shouts, he's not just releasing everything pent up from the graveyard at the end of book 4, it is all the suffering he's experienced before that too. Early on in Order of the Phoenix, we find out that Mrs. Fig is a squib and has been watching over Harry. Harry asks why he was never told and why his stays over at her house had to be so miserable and she says that she had to make it that way because if he liked her house too much then the Dursleys would never let her watch over him when they're out and about. It is just one of the many heartbreaking reminders we get of how messed up his childhood was. If we were to go through these seven books without having at least one where we get to see Harry grieve and be hostile and furious and hurt the way he's hurting in this book then it just cheapens all the traumatic events he's experienced. It minimizes the impact of years of abuse from the Dursleys. It minimizes the impact of Cedric's death and Voldemort's return. Caps Lock Harry is the necessary hurdle we need to pass in order for him to start healing. The next stage in the stages of grief is bargaining, which is struggling to find meaning, reaching out to others and telling one story. For a while we see that Harry isn't ready for this. When we get to Hogwarts and Harry sees the Thestrals for the first time, he doesn't tell his friends about them. Harry did not want to tell the others that he and Luna were having the same hallucination. Thestrals perfectly represent the tone I'm talking about that runs through this book, the haunting beauty behind the grieving process. In order to see them, it isn't just about having seen death or death happening in front of you. That happened to Harry when he was a baby and again at the end of book 4, so he should have been able to see them then. Some people still think of it as a plot hole, but I completely buy into the explanation that it is about understanding death in a broader context, which he couldn't do as a baby and couldn't do right after the initial shock of the graveyard scene. I love that this is where we are introduced to them, right as Harry is halfway through his stages of grief. And I love that he keeps it to himself because it shows that he isn't ready to reach out just yet. The chapter in which Harry finally makes the crossover to the final stages of grief is in chapter 15, The Hogwarts High Inquisitor. Here, she said anxiously, pushing a small bowl of yellow liquid towards him. Soak your hand in that. It should help. Harry placed his bleeding, aching hand into the bowl and experienced a wonderful feeling of relief. Thanks, he said gratefully. I love this scene because you have Hermione literally healing Harry from the physical wound he got from detention. And then she, along with Ron, present him with an idea that will lead to his emotional healing. That idea is that he should teach Defense Against the Dark Arts. Harry doesn't take this too well and Caps Lock Harry comes out yet again, but in a different way. Listen to me, said Harry, almost angrily. You don't know what it's like. You, neither of you, you've never had to face him, have you? The whole time, you're sure you know there's nothing between you and dying, except your own, your own brain or guts or whatever. Like you can think straight when you know you're about a nanosecond from being murdered or tortured or watching your friends die. And you two sit there, acting like I'm a clever little boy to be standing here alive. You just don't 
get it. What is really important to note about his rant here is that this is him finally making the crossover into opening up about all of his feelings. He goes off on how he feels about everything that has happened from book one to now. He's telling his story and what he gets in return is affirmation from his friends to keep doing that, which then leads to Dumbledore's army that represents the final stage of his grief. He's let everything out. He's moving on and he finally has meaning and a purpose. That is until the book decides to break our hearts again by having Harry go through the stages of grief all over again. Which brings us to part three, act three, Harry. Sirius's death is devastating on so many levels, but mainly it's because of the guilt it places on Harry. As if it wasn't enough that Sirius died because Harry fell for Voldemort's mind games. During the last pages of this book, we get a reveal that a gift Sirius gave him was a two-way mirror and Harry just left it sitting at the bottom of his trunk without opening it. And had he just opened it earlier, he would have been able to confirm Sirius's safety. I remember being so angry at the inclusion of this in the book because it felt like twisting the knife for no reason. We already got the point that Harry feels guilty, there was no need to go the extra mile and add an extra layer of guilt. But reading these final chapters now, I'm not mad at having to see Harry go through all this grief again right after he was starting to recover. Because like I said, I understand that this is about bearing witness to a boy, deal with loss, and go through his stages of grief. And this time, it doesn't take 30 plus chapters for him to go through all the stages, it takes four. When he sees Sirius die, he is immediately in denial. Save him! He's only just gone through! It's too late, Harry. We can still reach him! Harry struggled hard and viciously, but Lupin would not let go. There's nothing you can do, Harry. Nothing. He's gone. Right after that, his denial turns to anger. He uses the Cruciatus curse on Bellatrix, then, when in Dumbledore's office, Caps Lock Harry comes out. But even calling it Caps Lock Harry understates just how angry he is. He yells until his throat hurts, he trashes Dumbledore's office, and even has an urge to physically hurt Dumbledore himself. Harry felt the white-hot anger lick his insides, blazing in the terrible emptiness, filling him with the desire to hurt Dumbledore for his calmness and his empty words. Then he moves to depression, he finds the mirror which then leads to bargaining when he goes and finds nearly headless Nick to ask him about how the dead become ghosts and if Sirius can become one too. Then finally acceptance and moving on, which we get a hint of when he talks to Luna. And anyway, it's not as though I'll never see mum again, is it? Uh, isn't it? said Harry uncertainly. She shook her head in disbelief. Oh, come on. You heard them? Just behind the veil, didn't you? In that room with the archway. They were just lurking out of sight, that's all. You heard them. Well, have a nice holiday, Harry. Yeah. Yeah, you too. She walked away from him, and as he watched her go, he found that the terrible weight in his stomach seemed to have lessened slightly. All these stages are beautiful if you're willing to see it. Sirius dying is of course devastating, but the image of his death not being a grotesque one, but instead one where he just slips through to the other side is beautiful. And just as I learned to find the beauty and catharsis in reading Caps Lock Harry rail into Ron and Hermione at Grimald Place, I feel the same thing to an even greater extent when he's tearing Dumbledore and his office apart. Harry, suffering like this proves you are still a man. This pain is part of being human. Then I don't want to be human. I don't care. I've had enough. I've seen enough. I want out. I want it to end. I don't care anymore. You do care, said Dumbledore. He had not flinched or made a single move to stop Harry demolishing his office. You care so much, you feel as though you will bleed to death with the pain of it. And this ending with him reaching out to a strange girl that has also experienced tremendous loss and asking her about her story is so beautiful. This is the pulse that runs through the book and it is vital to his character arc. And now that we've seen him intensely deal with his grief and deal with it twice, 
it means that when we get to the next book, which is also my favorite of the series, there is a massive weight lifted off of the story. Even if things get darker, at least this kind of darkness, Caps Lock Harry darkness, has already been dealt with. So I just want to welcome anyone that has hated Caps Lock Harry the way I used to, to see that actually Caps Lock Harry is realistic, Caps Lock Harry is necessary, and if you're open to seeing it, Caps Lock Harry is hauntingly beautiful. That's it, thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to like and leave a comment. Special thank you to all my patrons. If you want to support the channel and also get early access to my videos, you can do so by going on patreon.com slash tropeanatomy. Again, thanks for watching, bye. One person couldn't feel all that. It'd explode. Just because you've got the emotional range of a teaspoon.